Okay, uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, that's joining us um, to the Museums and Race uh, Cypher programming for uh, 2020. Um, this, welcome to our virtual conference. Uh, we're thrilled that you all can join us. Uh, our collective work is designed to invite a more nuanced museum discourse, particularly around um, oppression identifying the complex and too often unacknowledged ways in which systemic structural norms influence decision-making so that cultural institutions present themselves in ways that are unacceptable and exclusionary to many. Uh, privilege, the pervasive assumptions of whiteness and wealth, which are counter to inclusion and diversity and in fact perpetuate white cultural dominance and intersectionality, understanding how race intersects with gender, social justice, class, and socioeconomic status. Uh, we're very glad that you're all joining us. We're glad um, that um, our uh, panel for today is uh, super exciting and we're, we're grateful for um, everyone uh, who's beaming in uh, and joining us. Um, so thank you everyone and we're gonna get started. Uh, so typically, oh, my name is Jackie Peterson, I should introduce myself. Um, I'm going to be your uh, host for this uh, cipher. Um, I'm on the Museums and Race Steering Committee. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and uh, my moderator and co-facilitator, um, Stacey Mann, is also joining us. Uh, she'll be moderating um, the chat and the Q&A when we get around to that portion of the cipher. Uh, so she'll be engaging with you all in the chat. Um, I encourage you all to please use the chat uh, or the Q&A if you have questions. Uh, and so typically, uh, if any of you joining us from afar have been to our in-person programming, we typically uh, offer a land acknowledgement for the place that we are in uh, for the indigenous people of that area. Uh, but since we are all beaming in from various places, uh, I invite you all to take a moment to reflect on uh, the Indigenous people uh, where you are. Um, I am currently on uh, occupied, unceded uh, territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish, um, here in what we call Seattle, Washington. Um, and so please take a moment to reflect on um, how you can support Indigenous people in your area. Um, next, I just wanted to share a few quick guidelines for um, participating. Uh, we are um, a very broad and expansive community here, um, but we are holding space for these conversations because they are necessary and important. Um, people will be sharing uh, the truths of their lived experiences um, and their experiences uh, in the museum field. Um, people are going to be very honest about um, their thoughts and experiences so that we ask everyone to please be um, respectful, but also be curious. Um, we're in a space of learning um, and we ask everyone to have generosity of spirit to that end. Um, have fun. Uh, these are meant to be um, interesting and enjoyable experiences, we hope, for everyone. And um, please express appreciation for the people who have uh, shared here, both in the formal way as the leaders of this cipher, but also informally in the chat. Um, we believe that this is a community of peer learning and we're here to learn from each other. Uh, and so um, please be uh, open minded and open hearted um, as we kind of enter into these discussions, which may be difficult for a lot of folks that may be new to these kinds of conversations. Um, so we ask that everyone be respectful of both the presenters today and your peers um, in the chat room. So without further ado, um, our cipher today at this time is uh, teaching against oppression and exclusion in museums, mapping black and Latinx queer stories to Latinx history now, youth-centered uh, resistance. And I will turn it over to our moderator for today, uh, Therese Quinn. Hi everybody, I'm gonna do a screen share, so this might take a second. that look good? Perfect. 
So everybody, thank you so much uh, for coming to our round table. I'm really excited to be here and to be participating in what I think is just a, a wonderful historic event. I also want to thank the organizers of Museums and Race who are all volunteers, we should note, and are people who are clearly committed to justice work through culture. Oops. Oh, I see, I've got to... Hmm, there we go. Um, so I'm going to start us off by sharing some of the themes that animate our presentation today. And then we'll be hearing from all of the co-presenters who you see here, Nancy Villafranca, Ivan Guzman, and Liliana Macias. We'll each introduce ourselves and our work, talking briefly enough, we hope, to uh, make sure that we have plenty of time for dialogue and questions at the end of our session. I want to start by acknowledging my positionality as a white, queer, cisgender woman who has moved from working to middle class over the course of my now 62 years of life. I've been working in and around museums for decades now, starting out as an intern in the 1990s and then eventually gaining full employment as a media researcher, an exhibit developer, uh, an evaluator, a writer and editor, and in a number of other positions in museums. But before I was a museum, Museum worker, I was politically active, participating in feminist and LGBTQ movements and, and organizing. In sixth grade, for example, I fought for the rights of uh, our, our sixth grade girl class or the, the girls in our class to wear pants to school. And at 17, I joined a lesbian theater group that mobilized for queer visibility and rights. And then as I matured and better understood the intersections of oppression, I became active in movements for justice, organizing to counter structural racism and white supremacy, our disabling society, and increasingly capitalism and its many destructive effects. And I brought these views into every museum job I had. My politics inform how I think about my cultural work. And they infuse this book, uh, which I published in January, uh, uh, 2020, which has the goal of supporting teachers to use museums as springboards to teaching for justice. I imagine museums as potential resistance buildings. They have the resources to educate and to incite action. They are public assets for our communities. They can bring the natural world to people in cities, the global world to people in rural communities, and experiences with the arts and culture to everyone. Yet, as we all know, museums could be much better than they are, despite their, their poten potential to support independent learning and classroom teaching, many museums are underused. And as the Visitors of Color Project has documented, uh, and many people have written about and talked about, people of color have described their alienation from and within museums. These problems persist to this day, of course, and the ways that museums act to uh, remedy them often seem more intended to repair their reputations than to effect change. Call me cynical, but it's a cynicism based on my experiences serving on a diversity committee in every museum I've worked for and attending decades worth of AAM and other conferences focused on diversity and social justice, while museums remain as segregated and exclusionary today as they were when I entered the field. Yet I also know from my years of organizing that change can be slow. Museums, like all public institutions, are as fantastic and as flawed as our society is. They can't be any different than that. Like public schools, they are sites of struggle over whose knowledge is of most worth. As workplaces, museums may or let's just say often do, exploit their employees. In recent years, both teachers and museum workers are organizing unions, um, striking and fighting for both the resources and respect to do a good job at work. In my view, this is the right direction for both formal and informal education sectors. Museum workers are not uniquely oppressed on the job. They face many of the same problems um, faced by other workers, stagnant wages, precarious employment, austerity budgets, and so on. But just looking at the histories of how everyday people have resisted their oppression, for example, by starting labor, a labor movement to fight for the, end to an, for the right to an eight-hour workday, today we remember and can be inspired by often ignored museum histories. Just as schools, museums are an ancient form invented by people for their teaching. 
While most Western histories identify museum origins in Europe, the world's first public museum was started in the 6th century BCE in an area that is now in Babylonia, which is now Iraq. It was started by a woman named Enigaldi Nana. She was a religious leader who lived there and uh, organized this museum with her father as a teaching site. And the oldest known exhibit labels written in three languages on clay cylinders were found in her museum. Cite Black Women is the slogan of a campaign that was started in 2017 by anthropologist Kristen Smith to encourage everyone to acknowledge and honor Black women's creative and intellectual production. In line with that imperative and also remembering Black as a political identity, in my book I propose that the histories of museums should always center and cite this woman, Eni Galdi Nana. Just as importantly, the histories of mu the connections of museums to radical social movements should be highlighted. What is the palace that became the first major public art museum? I'm sure someone out there knows. Um, it's the Louvre, Palais, which was liberated from the king during the French Revolution and protected from looting and damage by artists and given a new name, the Palace of the People. The revolutionary government redefined its collections as a precious possession of the people, not of royalty. Like schools, museums are more than one thing. They are the evidence of colonialism and also of human creativity. And sometimes they are about cultural justice. In the United States, drawing energy from global anti-colonial and liberation movements, Black and Latinx people, and especially women, many of whom were also public school teachers, like these three women on this slide, um, initiated new culturally relevant museums. Chicago was a center of this. And because I'm a, I have hometown pride, I'm going to offer a few of these examples in a, a little more detail. Margaret Burroughs, who you see here, helped to create the Southside Community Arts Center, uh, which was a, a, a WPA project in 1940. Um, and she also started the DeSable Museum of African American History, the oldest museum of black culture in the United States in 1961. Helen Valdez in the middle co-founded the National Museum of Mexican Art, the only accredited Latinx museum in the nation in 1982. And Peggy Montez opened the Bronzeville Children's Museum, the first and only African American children's museum in the country in 1998. These institutions collect the material culture, exhibit the art, and share the histories of groups that are underrepresented in mainstream museums, and also provide essential cultural career opportunities for people of color who are still largely excluded from our nation's museum workplaces. And this work of imagining continues. Latinx museum worker and artist uh, Ronald Woodeman has been dreaming of and sketching a Latino museum for the mall in Washington, D.C. for years. Who is the museum for? Jan Henry Gray, a poet who was born in the Philippines, um, Gray imagines a maid museum that honors the care and service labor frequently provided by immigrants, nannies, housekeepers, drivers, nursing assistants. Um, and so many others. In one of his poems, Made Poem Number 7, HR, which you see here, he writes, we honor the many who have cooked meals in other people's kitchens, washed floors, labored on holidays, nursed the frail and tended the children. Reminding the reader of the relentlessness of these tasks, the poem concludes, the Maid Museum is currently hiring. Gray challenge us, challenges us to imagine museums for everyone. Beginning in the 1990s, disability activists began using the phrase, nothing about us without us, emphasizing a tenet of all justice-centered social movements, that people know what they need and can speak for themselves. Again, looking to social movements for inspiration, how would our practice in museums change if this mandate was extended to those spaces? As one example of this line of thinking in action, in 2018, a consortium of 20 activist groups in New York City came together to call for the decolonization of the Brooklyn Museum. After pointing out that the museum has the largest collection of colonial era objects removed from Africa, they asked for the museum to establish a decolonization commission to acknowledge that it is on the territory of the Lanai Lenape people 
and to inventory all objects created by African and indigenous groups with the goal of reparations and repatriation and improve working conditions and pay for ground staff, including food and janitorial service and security, the jobs most commonly held by people of color working in museums. Another version of this is the People's Archive of Police Violence in Cleveland. It's outside a museum and organized by a collaborative of archivists, organizers, and others. But shouldn't a, a city history museum take up this kind of charge? When we fight for each other, we get stronger. Disabled queer Chicago artist Sky Cubicub publishes Radical Visibility, a magazine and resource for quip, a quip queer crypt teens and has a fashion line called Rebirth Garments, which you can see in this image. Crip and queer are names used to, quote, shake things up, jolt people out of their everyday understandings of bodies and minds, of normalcy and deviance, Sky says. They are words that help to forge a politics. I'm interested in how museums can teach this kind of resistance, to use those kinds of words. As Ella Baker, the racial justice organizer said, strong people don't need strong leaders. We should all be making museum exhibits and meanings. It's the combination of critical seeing and naming as we go that is powerful and can be used in our efforts to reshape museums so that they serve justice. For example, to draw attention to disturbing histories and museum practices, art historian Alice Proctor conducts what she calls uncomfortable art tours at six British museums. These, quote, examine the role of museums in creating hierarchies of civilized and savage and tell tour participants how objects came to be there. She invites visitors to download feedback postcards, which you see here, from her website that can be used to tell a gallery or museum how to improve its labels. Prison abolitionists abolitionists challenge us to imagine what kind of society we would need to make to be able to abolish prisons. This is a great provocation, and I think versions of it can be applied to museums and other cultural spaces. What kind of futures are we making through the work we do and the structures that we put in place in these institutions? This is why I'm leery of curation and um, I'd like to challenge some of these forms. Uh, that to me, curation reinforces hierarchies of knowledge and power. Exhibits and other forms of cultural work can also model and foster justice-centered values and aims. So I'm going to close by sharing one example of this. In 2011, a group of artists, lawyers, and formerly incarcerated people came together as the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials Project. They ultimately won victories for the hundreds of men and women who were to tortured by um, city police in Chicago over decades through organizing that included the use of exhibits strategically as a way to attract and also to educate the public about really a hidden sort of story. They distributed a call for proposals for a speculative monument um, uh, uh, to memorialize the Chicago police torture cases, and they received back over 70, which were all exhibited. So this is a sampling of them. All of them are posted online. This is a close-up of one of the proposals for a police station designed in the shape of an electricity generator that was used as a torture device. The exhibition tr attracted a lot of attention and led to a series of pop-up exhibits in public spaces. And in the end, the city of Chicago approved a resolution that included 5.5 million in reparations for torture survivors. A Chicago public school history curriculum of this history of police torture that is now going to be taught to all Chicago public school children and the establishment of a torture justice center that offers counseling and other services to survivors. So I think this is a really wonderful example of how exhibitions can be used as tools for justice. Um, so I'm going to close now with this Panopticant kit that was created by Sylvia Gonzalez, who's a museum worker in Chicago. She created it to remind us to resist the Panopticon or the all seeing, all knowing institution. Her exercise um, invites everybody, including our students to reimagine a space. 
in various parts of the world, museum workers are all unionized. Museums loan out cultural objects to residents like libraries. They have kitchens for their visitors, but no collections. In other words, we can make new kinds of museums. We can completely reform them if we want to. So now our next presenters will share some examples of their museum-based efforts to remake the world by reimagining museums. Thank you. Thank you so much, Therese. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nancy Villafranca Guzman. Um, I would also actually like to start by just sharing a little bit more, you know, about who I am and my perspective, and especially from the perspective of a Latinx museum worker and a first generation Chicagoan. And I wanted to, I prepared just a couple of slides. And this first one, I wanted to choose some images that to me represented that kind of foundational experience that I had and also just my perspective with that has I guess grown over the years around equity and inclusion and and now that you know I'm, I'm a little bit more seasoned and older realized this was also my privilege you know having grown up in a museum that just affirmed my cultural identity uh, so much throughout the process and so I have these four images in front of you. The first one is an image by Yolanda Lopez, who's the illegal uh, alien pilgrim from 1978. And so this is an image, you know, that I grew up with. So, you know, instead of just hearing about, you know, some of the dominant narratives about, you know, glorification of founding fathers or, you know, benevol benevolent pilgrims and manifest destiny. Um, I actually also learned about a, our just indigenous past and the great civilizations uh, in this continent. Um, and that carried all the way through the influence um, in our culture, in my culture to this day. Um, likewise, you know, counter to the anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric than what that one continues to hear on the news. I grew up seeing murals uh, like the one that was created here by a Chicago artist and teens as part of a declaration of immigration exhibition in 2008 that the museum organized um, where right at the entrance of this uh, exhibition, I will never forget, um, visitors were greeted by actually our, our gallery attendants at that time that um, were just, you know, keeping the gallery safe, uh, dressed as border patrol <laughs> um, and asking people for identification right at the door. And so again, those are the kinds of experiences that, you know, were forming me. The third one, another artist um, that to me was really uh, influential, influential in that kind of perspective building is the La Libertad by Esther uh, Hernandez. And, and so here I want to point out that rather than just that, you know, idolizing Ellis Island as the right way or the main way or the good way uh, that immigrants have come through, um, I also learned about the, the origins um, and that identity connection to Aslan, especially uh, of, of Chicano uh, brothers and sisters, and also the symbol of, of liberty um, here again, having that root um, so strong in our, in our culture and in our past. And uh, the image also just reminds me a lot of how um, that common phrase of, um, what is it, the, <laughs> I'm forgetting the exact wording, but we, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Um, this image really kept me centered and, and reminded me about all that rich history that doesn't often get talked about, including the loss of land and the loss of territory. You know, when I was a tour guide in my college days at the NMMA too, I, I would learn about the U.S.-Mexico War, not as the U.S.-Mexico War, but as the North American invasion. <laughs> And then the last slide, uh, photo image that I wanted to share with you is an, a work of art by Malakias Montoya, The Oppressor. And to me, this image really, I, I connected with um, his artwork and this one in particular because it just reminds me of how I can embrace my own bicultural identity um, and not just think about, you know, forced assimilation. I can be, I can be both American and Mexican and reclaim also, you know, the symbol um, of the flag. And so, you know, for many years, I didn't think about how I could be included or was included in museums. 
I was centered at this museum. And in many ways, now I realized this was my privilege that as a young person, I did get this opportunity to grow up um, in a museum that just, um, you know, added to my own positive um, identity. Um, however, having said that, I was also at that time aware that the Mexican community, uh, especially in Chicago, is very diverse. And so that my experience as a museum person or as a uh, Latinx Chicagoan, you know, was very different. And it also didn't mean that the National Museum of Mexican Art, where I worked, was immune from equity and inclusion work. Um, because this just to me really reinforced how equity and inclusion is, is present um, or should be just present and important in every one of our museums. Uh, we were very aware um, that a lot of the, you know, uh, me uh, members of the neighboring community um, could have seen a museum as that's not for me, that's elitist, I'm not allowed there. Um, and we also knew that um, we just needed to do, to do more to connect uh, with our immigrant and working class community as well. And I keep thinking about two other sort of formative moments where, um, you know, as a younger cultural worker, I started thinking about inclusion before inclusion and equity were coined terms, you know, in the field. And that was when I saw um, a young person, a young child, he was about nine years old with his mom who was chaperoning on the field trip and saw the tortilla press on display. And he tugged at his mom's sweater and he said, look, mom, that's just like the one we have at home, just like the one in our kitchen. And so that tortilla press was included in a section about corn and the importance of corn in Mexican culture. Um, and it just really grounded me and centered me how important it is for us to you know, reach um, everyone and make those kinds of connections. And then another one that I'm remembering is when we launched one of our first after school programs, um, we, I had, uh, an immigrant mom come up to us and this was the day of our final presentation um, at the museum and she said thank you so much I, I you know I never thought that I was going to feel so integrated into the city um, as as easily as I now feel and so just it just made me think about um, the work is always there and no matter um, you know how inclusive the museum is being there's always work to be done and so looking back you know I I realize all of us are, uh, all museums are on this journey. And so when I transitioned, you know, to the museum where um, I, I work now, um, I also just realized that, well, I wanted to, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, when I transitioned to now where I currently work at the Chicago History Museum, I wanted to, you know, take everything that I had learned and my reflection and my own experience and going for, to another museum that had to work with an even more diverse community and share that it needed to share those stories um, from a more diverse community. And so right away, of course, um, I realized that the gap was even larger, um, you know, having gone from that culturally specific museum to what we now consider um, a mainstream museum, there was a lot more work to be done to close the gap here. Um, and the challenge is, you know, it's huge for the Chicago History Museum as, I, as well I know for many um, other museums. And I, and I wrote this just sampling of words because they're, they're, they're so important to, to the work that we have to do at our museum and many other museums have to do too. But I chose to include this instead of like the external um, outputs that we, one would see from, you know, any museum, which are collection and exhibition and programs, um, which I consider to be the ones that you see at you know, the tip of the iceberg, right? You get to see the programs, you get to see the exhibits and highlights of the collection. Um, you know, now I, I, in my own sort of formation, I see that a lot of the work actually has to happen below the water <laughs> and it has to be structural and it has to be systemic and it includes all of these, addressing all of these things like employing, um, a diverse workforce and people of color, um, factoring that into the work culture, thinking about admission, accessibility, the way we collaborate, the way the perspectives we share, the way we do everything from day in and day out practices, processes, and the policies policies that guide all of this work. So this is this is sort of the structure work underneath that um, you know we're also doing at the museum in our own 
uh, sort of journey uh, of you know being more equitable and and more inclusive. And I was um, fortunate that when I joined this museum, some of that work was already you know, underway uh, with a capital campaign that included uh, large, um, well, to me, uh, <laughs> what I thought was a large amount of funding to make sure that we were increasing our presence in schools. And this is what I mean by, by structural, right? We secured enough funding to make sure that we had our own structure in the education department and addressed all of these words here within our department as well. Uh, to make sure that we were partnering with schools, that we were being responsive, that we were being inclusive and specifically paying attention um, to the students, the Latinx and, and Black students in the Chicago public schools. So that meant, you know, changing our approach, centering community, hiring a team that was sensitive and knowledgeable about this work, assessing, you know, the what we do. Um, revising our curricular framework, revising the way that we recruit or partner uh, with schools and our um, other collaborations, centering civic engagement, connecting past, present, and future, and also making it personally uh, relevant. And then also just working on the building of trust and, and relationships and setting the, the goals and the strategies that would help us to do that. Um, after you know this slide, I think uh, you will hear from some of my colleagues that and now all of us together get to make some of this vision into a reality, but without losing um, you know sight of the fact that a lot of this work is structural, and as you were saying, Therese, it takes a really long, long time to do this. Um, and although in our department, you know in some ways we have a little bit more flexibility with what we can do. Um, we also move in unison with the rest of the museum and we still have that, you know, really large gap to, to close over time, but we've gotten support and allies from um, partners and in this case, youth activists from our Latinx community. And I know that, you know, that was also another pivotal moment that has just infused so much energy and perspective into the future of the work. Now seeing them as really um, demanding also that the museum include Latinx history uh, as part of permanent exhibitions, as part of the collections. Um, and we could not be more thrilled to partner with them. And I know my colleagues later on will, will say a little bit more about you know, the influence that this also has had in our work. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate that this was a pivotal moment um, where these young activists also became you know, our, our allies and our partners in continuing to do the work. Thank you, Nancy. So we're going to watch this little uh, video that gets uh, gives a, an overview of what Nancy's just uh, referring to. Well, a recent class trip to the Chicago Field Museum left some Chicago High School students upset and offended. As CBS 2's Jim William reports, instead of just letting it go, the group is now pushing for answers and seeking some change. I think what makes this day really special is to sit down and, and really dig into some of the issues that you've raised. CBS 2 was the only camera allowed inside a meeting between leaders of the Chicago History Museum and about 15 students from the Instituto Justice Leadership Academy. Basically, this is a Chicago History Museum, so we would like to see more of our people. The alternative school is expressing their disappointment after noticing the exhibits and narratives about Latinx people fell short. Imagine how many younger kids came and didn't think that their um, ethnicity or their family background wasn't as important because they didn't see it in the museum. During a trip to the museum in September, some of the students in Anton Migliata's class felt offended when all they saw was a lowrider car in the lobby. Low riders are often associated with, you know, hot rodding and, and vehicles and cars and, and Latinx history is associated, uh, makes this association with cars. Isn't really even Latinx, it's more of like an L.A. thing. Our intention was not to offend, uh, but that, that is a failure, I would say, uh, definitely that lies specifically with me. The students launched a campaign to bring public attention to this issue and to get the museum to make changes. They made banners, created a social media buzz, and wrote letters to the museum about their concerns. We've got some work to do. Hopefully, through this process of meeting with you, you can help us think about what that, those next steps for the museum might be. And now they're getting results. 
a first step in what they hope will become a permanent or long-running exhibit. Oh, I'm glad that um, questions are being answered and, and that we're coming into agreements. I've, I'm shocked because we actually got this far. I thought it wasn't going to go this way. So hopefully we can move forward in a, in a collaborative way. Good for them for speaking up. Jim tells us at the end of the meeting, the group picked another date to gather, this time at the school. Statistics show the Latinx community makes up at least 30% of Chicago's population. Uh, well, a recent class trip to the Chicago... Thank you so much, Therese, and I think um, Ivan will be following me next, but I don't know if any of you caught that. The reporter actually made a mistake and named the wrong museum at the beginning. Um, you know, it, it's the Chicago History uh, Museum, and happy to report that um, those meetings did happen and they continue to happen. Things are a little bit on hold uh, because of COVID-19. Um, but uh, there will be an exhibition at the Chicago History Museum fo focusing on uh, Latinx history in, in two to three years um, or so. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Nancy and Therese. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ivan Guzman, um, and I am currently, just a little bit about myself, currently the team programs coordinator at the Chicago History Museum. Prior to joining the museum, I was also um, a high school social studies teacher for a couple of years in Little Village in Pilsen. Um, so that's kind of um, where my background is in. Um, so to kind of uh, jump off from the clip, um, I think as uh, I think I think just one thing I want to like say is that I think youth-led resistance is a lot more powerful and impactful than any other form of resistance. I think it's um, amazing, and I think as museum as museum professionals of color, um, we have almost sort of come to a compromise. Uh, with the underlying uh, underlying white supremacy that exists in a lot of these institutions um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, we all need to survive and eat and, and get a paycheck. But also, I think, so having youth point out and push back against this white supremacy um, and also is extremely empowering for us who are trying to do some of this work um, in, in these institutions, and um, which is also true for a lot of uh, you all who are watching. Um, so it, it it, it validates our work and it motivates us to continue doing our work. Um, and so the way that our work attempts to address issues, um, these issues, um, is uh, kind of um, looking at how are we engaging with uh, communities, um, you know, through uh, various education programs and initiatives. Um, so one thing, uh, one initiative that the Chicago History Museum is currently um, working on is the Chicago Learning Collaborative. Um, and to uh, and this is uh, a program or an initiative that consists of various programs that uh, seek to uh, be responsive to the audiences that it works with. Um, and the way it does this is um, looking at uh, culturally responsive uh, curriculum and providing culturally responsive curricular resources. Um, and what that looks like is um, using students' cultural background and past experiences. Um, and scaffolding those experiences and that previous knowledge to kind of um, meet the students where they're where they are at, um, presenting relevant topics to um, increase buy-in and get them to um, more more readily uh, be engaged. Um, and uh, furthering this uh, by presenting these relevant topics, we're able to then engage students in uh, inquiry uh, strategies that allows them to then. Um, Look at these topics, uh, question these topics, and critically think about them. Um, also, making uh, all of the while making real world connections that uh, brings the past to the present, and then also has them thinking about the future. Um, and the only way, um, additionally, this also uh, helps them develop their comfort with uh, questioning uh, traditional historical narratives that oftentimes have left them out of these narratives. Um, so uh, questioning those narratives is, is, is very important, especially as a history museum. Um, and the only way to, for this learning um, component to be successful is to um, have a collaborative effort amongst all people involved in um, this learning. So of course, that includes the students um, and the teachers. Uh, the way that our curricular resources are developed and uh, tested and reviewed 
uh, and adapted are is with uh, in collaboration with teachers. Teachers have input and feedback um, because they are the only ones that know their particular students the best. Um, also, they um, are able to then take that, uh, those resources and adapt them to however uh, they see fit for their particular classroom. So it's not kind of a one size fits all. Um, additionally, uh, we have uh, collaborators um, outside of the schools, which would be uh, teaching artists, uh, other museum uh, staff that we work with, um, as well as partner organizations to provide additional opportunities or content expertise uh, to these resources. Um, and also, and more, and I think more importantly, is getting parents involved in this collaborative uh, effort um, and learning, uh, because uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, learning doesn't stop um, once students leave the, the schools. Um, we, have to, we have to also support parents and how they're supporting their students at home and their students learning at home. Um, so that's, that, that looks like leading workshops uh, for parents specifically, um, introducing them to the curricular resources and activities that their students do in class. So they are familiar and they know uh, what's going on. But then additionally, on that side of that, providing resources that parents can then use at home with their students and how they can support their students um, themselves. Um, so that's kind of um, an overview of the Chicago Learning Collaborative and a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, and um, if we go to the next slide, I can uh, show you uh, just an example of some of this work. Um, so currently, the Chicago Learning Collaborative is uh, uh, made up of various programs. The more longstanding established one is Chicago Literacies that works with um, students from grades three to three to five. Um, and that one, uh, Liliana will talk a little bit more about uh, in just a second. Um, th there's a new uh, program that we are piloting on the next school year, uh, Chicago Inquiries, that will work with middle school students, uh, sixth to eighth grade, um, and, pair, and pairs Chicago history with the inquiry uh, method. Um, and then for high school students, um, grades 9 through 12, um, we uh, were going to pilot the Chicago Artivism curriculum program. Um, and because of everything that's happened, um, the pilot didn't go as planned, but we are kind of still working with um, educators to uh, revise and um, finalize uh, the curriculum and have a better pilot, uh, more fuller pilot um, next school year. And what that looks like is pairing uh, Chicago history um, with uh, art and activism and civic engagement. Um, so connecting those two and, and inspiring students to be more civically engaged and civic minded. Um, and one of those examples uh, is of one of those lessons is a Chicago blues um, and it's connected to uh, hip hop and cultural appropriation. Um, so it makes it a little more relevant uh, to present day, but it still acknowledges the roots of um, hip hop music in blues and other uh, black musical traditions. Um, so students are able to kind of get a historical background and context on Chicago blues and the music scene and, his, and the historical significance of that in the city. Um, and then the following day, the, the following lesson, then they are, they, they are able to make those connections to the um, uh, current kind of uh, hip hop uh, music scene and the roots that are there. Um, and just to uh, provide some example, um, even though we weren't able to do a full pilot of the Artivism program, um, we were uh, lucky enough to be able to work with one teacher, um, uh, one TPS educator on the south side of Chicago to kind of um, implement some of these uh, lessons and also um, uh, provide feedback and work with them to kind of um, continue uh, improving uh, the curriculum. And um, he was also able to uh, uh, implement uh, some of the curriculum digitally and remotely. So that will be something new that we will have to include for next school year. And just to share uh, one student response with you all, um, this was a student response to a reflection question on the uh, a song analysis by the hip hop artist Mostef. Um, so they were just picking out a line that stood out to them, that caught their attention, that spoke to them, um, and then kind of briefly explain why. Um, so as you can see, the lyric that they um, chose is there in black and then the kind of student response is in red. And I think just to read it real quickly, uh, these lines all catch my attention because this artist is confronting history 
And I really like that phrase that they used is confronting history. And I think that's ultimately the goal of um, artivism, the artivism curriculum, but in general, the work that we're trying to do is to get students to confront history and question it. Um, and then she goes, they go on to say, African-Americans started and created a lot of things that they aren't credited for or given recognition for. Um, so I was really happy to see this response because it was, um, that was the kind of, uh, that was the hope to kind of get them to see um, some of these things and, and dive deep into some of these lyrics, but then also the overall concepts. Um, so that's just a kind of quick brief example of some of the work uh, that we're doing. Uh, and uh, to talk a little bit more about the Chicago Literacies Program and some of the examples from that particular curriculum, um, I can turn it over to my colleague Liliana uh, to share some of those. Thank you, Ivan. Therese, you can move on. Thank you. Um, so as Ivan mentioned, uh, the Chicago Learning Collaborative actually started with the um, Chicago Literacies Program, and I was the coordinator of it. Um, so as Ivan mentioned, we put a lot of thought into the framework. Um, when I first uh, became the coordinator for Chicago Literacies, I realized that though the framework was there, the content of that framework was still in need. Um, and so one of the things that I first did um, when I took over the program was create a um, Chicago Literacies curriculum, which is actually now the basis for Chicago inquiries and then uh, artivism. So it all started with the framework with Chicago Literacies, which looks at history as um, uh, and like a, a concept that is hard to grapple with, but also most definitely needs to be approached. Um, and so, of course, we started the history of Chicago with the <laughs> with uh, the recognition and the history of indigenous peoples of Chicago. Um, and so uh, three units were developed. The first one was to go into detail about the various indigenous populations of uh, what the place we now call Chicago, uh, the establishing of the city, but looking at uh, key players as such as Ida B. Wells, um, DuSable, uh, labor unions in the stockyard. So really uh, honing in into that people's pedagogy that Howardson often talks about, which is telling the history of um, things through folks that normally don't make it into history. Um, and then the third component is the Chicago uh, neighborhoods. Um, the neighborhoods that I chose to write curriculum about are the neighborhoods where the Chicago literacies programs are in. So a lot of the students who participate, for example, in Pilsen are reading about Pilsen, Little Village, they're reading about Little Village. Um, in uh, Humble Park, they're reading about Humble Park. And so um, all of this was done intentional, um, as Ivan said, to follow the framework of the Chicago, Liter uh, Chicago Learning Collaborative. And so this is one example of a lesson that, um, an article and a lesson. So the articles uh, for Chicago Literacies do this really great thing where we tell the history of Chicago, but we kind of pan out um, in these little side boxes here on the bottom. Um, and to connect it culturally with our audiences. So we know that for Chicago Literacies, our audience are Latinx youth who are learning to speak English. And so one of the things that I wanted to do on purpose was to connect um, these larger Chicago themes with also um, culturally relevant content. So for example, here we talk about oral histories um, and the tradition of oral histories and in indigenous populations, but then on the side box, side box we also I also connected it to corridos Mexican corridos which are very similar they tell history um, and they and it was used to tell history from town to town to pass on the news and so that was super important and one of the reasons why I chose uh, to talk about corridos is because it integrated a new subject for example music <laughs> and so for the lesson plan the um, educators focus on that and um, what came out of it was actually pretty amazing so Teresa if you can go to the next screen next slide Thank you. Sorry for the bad pictures, but this was done in a whim. So one of the great things about Chicago literacies is that sometimes educators invite us to come and see what they're doing in the classroom. That's part of the collaborative component of uh, Chicago literacies is not just them coming to us when we 
they need something or we need something from them is us engaging with them in the classroom. Um, and so one of the lesson plans that came out of this uh, unit, particularly on indigenous Chicago and Corridos, uh, was this beautiful <laughs> curated um, uh, lesson where the educator encouraged their third graders, because these are all third graders, to write corridos on the contents of the articles that they were reading. So you will see how he laid it out. Uh, the first one is the introdu introduction, so letting the kids know what they're going to be working on, corridos about indigenous women that influence Chicago. The second one um, has their essential question and the social studies standards, because all of the articles have lesson plans that cover particular standards, um, and then an explanation about corridos, and then the three articles that they were using, um, so they learned about why Chicago was called Chicago. <laughs> um, they learned about, you know, um, Dusabo, and then they learn about uh, indigenous women as creators and pioneers, and then integrating another component, the component of music. Uh, this particular educated, educator decided to use the Kandinsky app, which allows uh, students to draw pictures, and then the pictures become music. And so now we have all of these various different components in this one lesson plan that utilize three of the Chicago Literacies articles. Now I do, unfortunately, I do have video of the kids performing this, but I couldn't embed it into the presentation, but I can share it off my laptop if that's okay, Therese. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, Sorry, I, I think I have to stop sharing. Hold on. Yeah. I didn't mean to advance. I'm clicking. I don't know. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. okay. Um, so share computer sound. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example of some of the work that the students did. And this is from um, Hamline Elementary School in Back of the Yards. Indigenous women made blueprints to change Chicago's future. We are all great, uh, but that's a, a good example of how uh, the Chicago Learning Collaborative really brings a whole new approach to uh, museum work, museum work, particularly with the youth and that has that cultural um, component embedded in it. And actually that experience was really great. Nancy and I both had the opportunity to visit the classroom and um, yeah, I got to say, I think at one point I needed to like hold back tears because it was such a beautiful expression of like the work that we truly are doing in these classrooms. And I think it re um, like it reasserted to me that the Chicago Learning Collaborative model is truly just an amazing way of connecting. Um, and so just to segue a little um, <laughs> um, as uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this is what I, uh, and I'll introduce myself. So I am a colleague of Ivan and Nancy. I am the coordinator for the Chicago Learning Collaborative, although that's changing because these programs are so amazing that the collaborative is growing. And so we'll have coordinators and a manager. Um, and so apart from that, I'm also a public historian. Um, and I'll talk about this um, exhibition that you see in front of you. You're probably wondering, queer as German folk, what does that have to do with, uh, you know, um, mapping or resisting oppression? But it does actually have a lot to do. Um, and so also I am an instructor at Northeastern. I teach for the Women and Gender Studies. Um, and I also uh, occasionally teach for the sociology department, particularly the sociology of Latinas course. Um, and so I take all of these things um, and apply them really to both what I do at the museum and what I do with my students at the university as well. Um, and just to segue back into the public historian, 
historian part. <coughs> so um, one of the um, really beautiful opportunities that I got this past uh, June in 2019 um, was the direct, one of the members of the Goethe Institute, which is the German cultural institution, um, um, reached out to me because they heard about my work. Um, I uh, did my master's in Latinos and Latin American studies with an emphasis on Latinx queer cultural production in working class neighborhoods and resistance to Chicago segregation. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more when I get into what this project developed into. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so Queer as German Folk actually was an exhibition that was put together by the Schulz Museum in Berlin. Um, and so what they wanted to do was to partner with um, the, the German institutes across the world because they have about 156 uh, throughout Latin America and Europe um, that promote German culture. And so um, the Goethe Institute here in Chicago um, decided to host the Queer as German Folk uh, component. So what they did is that the Schulz Museum created this exhibition and then uh, sent it across the United States and other in Latin America um, to host um, and then add a local component and all of this was in celebration of the 50 years of the Stonewall riots or uprising which we can have a longer debate about why those words uh, but for now we'll just leave it at that <laughs> and so uh, out of that came the queer as German folks and so um, when Ermi, what's her name, uh, contacted me and said, and asked me if I wanted to work with her, I said, absolutely. Um, at first I was really confused. So I'm like, I don't know what <laughs> German. Um, and so she was like, don't worry about it. This is something different. And so I said, yes. And it was a really great opportunity for me um, to kind of look at the way in which, as Therese mentioned, ensuring that whatever Queer story, we, queer stories we have to tell about Chicago that they encompass a wholesome story, uh, like a wholesome view into the history of uh, queer Chicago, and that doesn't necessarily focus in Boys Town. And I'll explain a little bit as to why um, that was the purpose. And so this is a little bit about how I got involved in this exhibition called uh, Queer as German Folks. Can you move to the next slide? Um, and so, as you can see, the purple, um, the over here in Germany, that's where the Schulz Museum is. And then these were the different sites um, where the, the exhibition was um, exhibited. So we have LA, Chicago, um, Guadalajara, Mexico. We have New York, of course, um, and a couple cities in Canada as well. So it was a pretty big effort. Um, you can switch to the next one. And so the exhibition talked about uh, queer folks in Germany, the resistance movement. But as I mentioned, each of these places had to have a specific component, a local component. And so I was tasked with creating the local component of um, of these uh, of this exhibition. And so a lot of the work that I did for Mapping Queer Chicago Past and Present is rooted in the work that I have already been doing um, in regards to queer Latinx cultural productions in working class neighborhoods. And so um, the reason why I was inspired to create this, or at least the framework that I wanted to take, um, was um, through the work of Lawrence LaFontaine, Lourdes Torres, and Ramon Rivera, who talk about uh, towards a queer archive of Latinx queer Chicago. Um, and so generally they spoke about how uh, Latinx um, and Black folks often don't make it into the story about Chicago. And we saw this, we see th this every time. Um, for example, a couple years we saw the release of the, a movie on the Stonewall riots um, and the person who was credited for throwing the first brick was a cis white male. And that's completely rewriting history because we know that it was actually a Puerto Rican and a black trans woman who started this. And so to blatantly erase that, I think, uh, goes into why for me it was very important that I center these narratives in black and Latinx experiences. Um, mostly, like I mentioned, Chicago is a very segregated city and we do have a recognized um, LGT, 
enclave um, called Boys Town, um, which is located in the Lakeview um, neighborhood. And well, in Chicago, the Lakeview neighborhood is a very affluent neighborhood, is a predominantly white neighborhood. And so what that meant is that in recognition of Boys Town was a recognition of whiteness, particularly of queer and whiteness. Um, and so, um, uh, and so we noticed that a lot of the things that were coming out of Boys Town was in recognition of that queer whiteness, particularly in their response to protests to, for example, the Pride Parade uh, for Black and Brown individuals. Having cops in the pro in the Pride Parade was actually really problematic, not only because of the history of celebration of Pride, which was in resistance to police, um, but it was also uh, the fact that it completely ignored the fact that black and brown queer individuals have an entirely different history with police. And as you saw earlier, Therese Percent, there's a long history of torture as well. Um, and when you add queer to that um, experience, it amplifies and um, makes everything much more complex. And so with all of this in mind, um, I wanted to map a queer Chicago that actually honored the stories because if you dig deep enough, you eventually find that indeed the story of queer Chicago has Latinx roots and it has black roots. We know that the very first uh, ballroom uh, culture, uh, cultural center was Bronzeville and yet we, a lot of people don't know this actually and Bronzeville is a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago and it is a black neighborhood. Again, Chicago is extremely segregated so each of the neighborhoods has a majority. And so I wanted to pull these super important um, uh, sites because I wanted to honor their stories. Um, I, as I mentioned, uh, Boy Sound has a very um, queer uh, Latinx and Black roots, and so Mapping Queer Chicago was really just in honor of uh, celebrating those sites and making sure that folks could have access to those stories um, to again, just reinsert uh, the need to resist the uh, erasure that white supremacy brings into various components of, of our stories, not just the ethnic uh, racial one. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Liliana and everybody. Um, I think we still have a little bit of time for some questions. And so um, here we are. <laughs> Great, thank you all. That was so, so wonderful. Uh, we appreciate you so much for sharing all of your phenomenal work. Um, I'm super inspired and excited personally about um, everything that you are all working on. Uh, we do have um, two, uh, Two brief questions um, from some of our attendees. The first one is really more of a request than a question. Um, we were asked if the uh, presenters would be willing to share uh, sources and links to the projects that you spoke about uh, in your presentations. Um, you can drop those into the chat. Um, if you also want to share your social media handles or the social media handles of those projects or institutions, that would also be great. Um, we can also, as museums and race, share that out broadly. If you uh, send us those links, we're happy to broadcast those too. Um, but folks are very interested in um, the projects that you were talking about and would love um, to access those resources. So if you could please share them, if you're comfortable with doing so. Um, our second question is, uh, how have the students from Chicago, how do they feel about the slow pace of museums uh, like that um, and that how long it's it's taking to kind of um, enact some of those changes that you're pushing for? Um, well, this is Nancy, and I, I can start first. Um, as you probably saw somewhere in the video clip, um, I think the phrasing that they were they used when they did their campaign was "Latinx history now!" exclamation. So. Uh, I don't know that we've asked them how they felt about the pace uh, of museums, but we know that they, they really, they mean now <laughs> and they mean fast. Um, you know, soon after that first meeting happened um, with maybe less than a month later, um, a group of us went to meet with them at their school. 
Um, and we've since then had a, a, a few more meetings. So uh, they're, they're, you know, they're very demanding as, as they, they should be. And they um, ask for deadlines. And when we've met, um, they always make sure to revise, you know, next steps. This is what, what is going to happen from here to there. And so where we are right now is they are taking the lead on organizing uh, the, a committee, a, a committee so that um, this information um, so the committee will will guide uh, the work moving forward and will act as the as the body also to to advise and help inform decision making. To add a little bit to what Nancy said, um, I think like having worked with teens um, previously, I think it's it was important to um, be transparent in terms of how long um, right, some of the, the things that they wanted would take, um, and just be honest about that. Cause we all know as museum professionals that an exhibition takes years to, of planning and, um, working on. So, um, and just being transparent about that, but then also thinking of ways in which we could engage with these students, um, um, more and more in the short term. So what are some things that we can do, um, you know, in a couple of months, to uh, take some of uh, their demands, some of their ideas, and um, implement them uh, quickly, um, well, as quickly as a museum can. Um, so that was something that was very important for us. And that's something that um, I think, uh, even just like organizing the committee and having a group of people to kind of work through some of those things is, gonna, is going to be very important. Yeah, and I think another component as to like the students feeling a little bit at ease about the length of the pro of when this would be put on. Um, I think it also helped them to meet us um, and to see the work that we were doing. Um, I visited their classroom several times to talk about Chicago literacies and um, and they actually ended up using some of the resources from Chicago literacies. Um, but they were like, why didn't we know that this exists? Why is it amplified? And why isn't something that we automatically say, oh, yeah, this is what they're doing. But also Chicago literacies was in his second year. So it was fairly new. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we have a question uh, from our chat. Uh, this is a question for everyone. Um, Therese opened with a discussion of the intersection between activism and museums. Have you seen these projects change the institutions you are a part of? Uh, are institutions changing or something else? No, probably. Um, I haven't been working in a museum for several years, but um, when I was working in museums, I, I certainly did see that people organizing could make a change. So, for example, I was one of the co-organizers of the first LGBTQ employees group at Field Museum, and that group still exists today, decades later, and people are still using that um, gathering as a platform to make change. At, at the time when I started the group with others there, we were trying to get uh, benefits for domestic partners of, of queer employees. And, you know, now they're probably working on other issues. But, you know, we, we did make some change in that way. But I think my, my colleagues at the History Museum might have other perspectives on that. Nancy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm just trying to read the question uh, quickly as yes, uh, maybe thinking about examples. Um, it's, it's hard for me to recall right now either a model or an example of something, you know, that has um, worked in that way. Um, I mean, a, a lot of, um, there are some museums, I guess, in New York where I think I draw some inspiration, um, you know, over the last several years. And so I, I think one of the reasons, um, you know, why a museum like the Tenement Museum of New York, in my mind, is so successful, right? Because that mission is so focused and is so centered uh, on immigration that it's just something that you see alignment from top to, top to bottom, side to side and diagonally. And so, you know, I look to that um, also because they have just really active uh, and participatory online projects as well, where, you know, the public can uh, participate in 
um, share their story. So that's, that's sort of one example. Um, I still find that museums struggle with centering activism and social justice. Um, and I think we still use the mask of neutrality, right, and objectivity um, to stay aw and, and staying away from that activism and not acknowledging inequalities, um, which, you know, in our work at the museum, we're trying, we're trying to center all of those stories that have rendered, you know, a lot of us feeling in invisible, right? When I saw that video that you shared, Liliana, I mean, I almost cried because that just connects to me personally so much, right? In the way that I feel like as those kids felt visible and, and I wanna feel visible in all the museums too. So that's, that's just, might not be a specific example, um, but it's one that, that I, I keep in mind a lot. I'll just add to that. I, I posted a couple things. Someone asked what inspirations were and I, I really am inspired by all the museum union organizers right now, especially a lot of those folks who have all just been laid off. And it's, you know, in museums, but also the folks who are trying to organize places like Amazon warehouses, you know, all, all those people know what they're up against. They know they're probably going to get fired and they do it anyway because they just know it's completely unfair in their workplaces. So um, that really inspires me. And I guess I think we should keep in mind that institutions are not in and of themselves radical. They're, they're the opposite of that. The change is always gonna come from this kind of tussle between the outside and the inside. It's always gonna be about struggle. So when we look at public education, there are wonderful teachers teaching in you know, horrible institutions often uh, that are oppressive to both the kids and the teachers, but the teachers unions keep organizing and keep fighting for justice and it, it should be the same in museums. Yeah, definitely. And I think to Alex's question about how can we make sure that this isn't just a trend. Um, I think that the youth have held the, at least for the example, the youth have held the museums, um, uh, the museum, the people who run the museum, the VP, the president, all of those folks who make big decisions accountable in ways that I feel like they would have not been responsive. Um, I think one of the really interesting things in the shift that I noticed was, you know, um, once the students did make these uh, statements and claims, um, a lot of which actually me, myself and my colleagues have previously made um, in the time that we have spent at the museum, um, and saw no results to see uh, things actually shift and move, um, I think is the, is the most impressive part of that. So I think it doesn't then, um, and Anton as well, yes. Um, so I think the students being able to hold the museum accountable um, is one of the ways in which they assured that this wasn't just going to be a trend uh, because they were basically saying, we are watching you and we will, you know, <laughs> We will organize if we have to, and they did it beautifully. And they were so well informed whenever they came to the meetings, they knew that exhibitions sometimes take a while to put together. And so they weren't completely outraged, they understood. Um, and so I think that that's really important is that uh, the students, and, and it shouldn't be that way, most definitely it should not. The youth shouldn't have to <laughs> fight to have their presence made, but considering, as Therese said, we do live in a white supremacist society, everything's structured in the way it is. It's beautiful to see that the students are empowered. And the one student even said it himself. He's like, I can't believe we made it this far. And I think that just shows how incredibly powerful and how it's not just like a moment or a trend. It is truly something that um, we, uh, it, as people who work in the museum, will continue to work towards while we have the support of the public as well. Thank you all. So I just want to be cognizant of everyone's time. We do have a bunch more questions. So I'm wondering if the panelists are okay. Uh, do you all have time to keep going with more questions? We still have a pretty amazing number of participants hanging in there. So if you guys are cool to keep answering questions, I'll just keep going. Okay, thank you. Uh, so our next question um, is, can you share how you presented the need for an exhibition of Latinx history to board members and trustees? And how do you hope uh, training of docents and educators will happen to relearn history about Latinx contributions in Chicago? Um, well, I'm, I wonder if I'm, 
probably the only one who has uh, presented in front of board members at the Chicago History Museum from the you know, education uh, perspective. I think one of the things that helped us in that communication is that about a year and a half ago, we embarked in our, in our own you know, uh, DE&I assessment. Um, and so this is already kind of the atmosphere and it was the environment and we were already um, just there was a lot more readiness and open minded. I think what this example did was just really put a light on it, show a really concrete example and showed how the community really is needing and wanting this to um, and I think it just created even more urgency. So, you know, maybe the fact that we were already in this, this, already doing this work made it a lot easier that it just kind of fit into an initiative. It just really forced us all to, to speed it up um, a little bit more um, and to it even go even deeper into these, you know, difficult conversations of how do we address um, all elements of the museum so that we can continue to show, for example, Latinx history, not just in that one exhibition that is coming up in a few years, but how do we integrate, you know, everyone's history all the time in all of our exhibitions. And so I feel like this just created a lot more, more depth. Um, I can't say that all the conversations are easy. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it's, uh, it can get exhausting. Um, and there's sometimes, you know, I feel very fortunate that I have Liliana and Ivan as my colleague and many others where sometimes I just need to step back a little bit because it's emotionally tolling. Um, but I think we're all on the journey. We're just at different levels um, of it um, at, at any given moment. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and as a quick follow up to that, um, what problems have you encountered with convincing leadership to pursue, the, pursue these topics? And what have been your most effective methods to persuade them that change needs to happen? And this could be for anybody. Liliana, I'm gonna just shine a light on you a little bit because earlier in the day, Liliana, just you were presenting actually to staff on some of these programs. And I think one of the things that has been um, helpful um, is to actually show and demonstrate what a program looks like, what, it, you know, to actually have um, maybe even have had experienced a pilot so that others can see what we mean. A lot of times we can describe something that still might seem sound foreign to others, but once we show, you know, what are the, what is the program? What are the components? What is the curriculum? What are the differences between what we were doing and were before and what we're doing now? It, it helps in some of those conversations. Leanne, I don't know if you want to add a little bit to that as, as far as um, the challenges, but I think we were fortunate enough that this funding, you know, was there and in place and we have a, we had a little bit of freedom to make decisions um, because the goal already was, was to be inclusive from the get go. And so we've, you know, we've been entrusted to, to make some of those decisions, but again, it doesn't mean it's not challenging, you know, um, along the way. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I think I had a conversation with Therese about this um, and about my just career in museums. Actually, before I started working in a museum, I didn't have the best opinions about museum because I never saw myself in a museum. I didn't feel welcome in a museum. Um, I remember feeling just like, don't touch anything, don't look at anyone, but also very much aware that people are looking at you because you're that one school from the South Side in the Field Museum or, you know, in any, the art museum. Um, and so I <laughs> never actually had a positive, uh, just, um, experience with museums. And so when I met Nancy and I saw the work that she was doing, um, I think that has allowed me to function two ways in the museum. Um, part of it is I am doing my job, right? I'm coordinating a program uh, and I give components of that program, but also part of it is uh, going a little bit rogue. <laughs> As I mentioned, um, the uh, curricular framework for Chicago Learning Collaborative came out of my efforts for the Chicago, uh, Chicago literacies. And so I think 
I just made the decision. I knew I wasn't going to ask, is it okay if I talk about indigenous people, even though the exhibition we currently have is really horrible and it does a lot of harm to these communities. And so um, a lot of it is just me giving very vague <laughs> descriptions of what I'm doing, uh, but then also just implementing all of those things that are in extremely important to me through an intersectional um, framework and everything that I do. Um, and very much like Therese too, that the importance of understanding the why we center black folks when we do the work that we do right um and so i think that that's really helpful um but yeah sometimes uh you know making these changes means <laughs> not showing people what you're doing and just giving very vague and uh, and just kind of navigating that as you go i know it's not the best <laughs> But you know, sometimes we do things, uh, these constraints are there for a reason and we have to, I mean, we can't fail, I can't fail my students and give them something that it's not impactful and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And I'm not here to do, you know, food court multi multi multiculturalism. I'm really truly here to have the students investigate and ask questions like, you know, I use the term colonist um, in the indigenous uh, portion of it. The students need to know that vocabulary, but also I will say, students these days are are far beyond I think uh, the credit that people give them you know with the access to the internet and the wonder of memes you can make <laughs> you can make a really solid you know case for when we are actually meeting the students where they truly are and these are real students versus the imaginary students that a lot of museums and education departments think that are out there, but we know, right? Because we're on the ground and doing that work with the students. So I don't know if that's a, <laughs> if that's a helpful answer, but that's the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Liliana. I I appreciate that that radical honesty. Um, that is so true. Uh, what's the saying? Um, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Yeah, I only knew it in Spanish. <laughs> I, I could have translated it this far, yeah. but yes, absolutely, definitely yeah. that phrase. I love that. Um, so we have another question here. Um, a follow-up to the current question, uh, considering what Therese mentioned about hierarchies of cultural labor and recent layoffs disproportionately affecting education, um, visitor services, and other frontline staff pushing these initiatives, where do you see the potential for advocacy? It's a great question. Well, I'll say something, um, but I think maybe other folks would want to talk about this too from the inside the museum. I'll kind of bundle it with another question that's about what do we do when museums that we really um, hold up as um, wonderful places, we, the term used here is like lionize them, we just think they're awesome from the outside, but, but people working on the inside know actually that they're really not such great places to work again every museum I've ever worked in has been kind of like that. <laughs> the people working in them are wonderful. They pay terribly. The administration is always horrible. So, you know, maybe it's just every workplace. Um, but I think there's a few things that come to my mind. Uh, you know, I canceled my Prime account. I did that before. And so, I'm, again, I'm kind of going back to other workplace situations. I did it before they fired Kristen Small, um, Christian Small, but I, I think that, like, you know, sometimes you just, you just don't put your money there. I would also say that I think people are already kind of boycotting a lot of these institutions, maybe not all of them, but visitorship has declined at a lot of museums. And, you know, you look at the quality of the exhibits, like Liliana was saying, the, the kids know that that's boring. It's boring, horrible stuff. So they don't go there. And, you know, so that's already happening. People are voting with their feet. So anyway, that's a couple perspectives on that. Yeah, I think um, we are, as it has given us a very particular, like, interesting position. And I think Ivan <laughs> kind of uh, had, a, and I had already had a conversation about this. Um, but also the, um, Ivan, if you can rem remind me the title of the project that you sent us to us in regards to uh, labor in museums from the Museum <laughs> Muse program, was that it? Oh yeah, so the um, Muse program, which I am a part, I was a part of, um, but I, uh, they, for one of their classes, uh, they kind of put together this um, 
essentially like an e-magazine on kind of around the issue of labor and museum and labor practices in museums. So I could share that link, um, or I don't know if Therese has it ready, uh, but um, I could share that link with everyone and it has some really cool examples about and just thoughts and opinion pieces and things like that that um, really speak to some of these issues. Um, so I, that's something that I can easily share with everyone. Yeah, and for me and Nancy, I feel like uh, we've decided to look at this very rough time <laughs> um, as an opportunity to finally be able to prove or to be able to have the backing that we didn't have before. For example, um, we emphasize the need for um, digital literacy, right? Just uh, for us, the, uh, the, the folks who work there um, and just like access to equipment, access to a larger collection that allows us to tell the stories. So that was probably one of the biggest issues that I, the issues that I confronted is how do you tell a history about Chicago, all of Chicago, when only a small portion of Chicago's population um, stories are in the museum, you know? <laughs> we have Abraham Lincoln's deathbed, but absolutely positively nothing on Latinx folks other than a Day of the Dead figurine, um, which is sad. <laughs> I don't know if it even belongs to the museum, but that's not the point. I think the, the point here is that um, this unstable time had a lot has allowed us to amplify those issues that we've seen before, that before they would just like, kind of brush off, but now it's like, hey, we need digital literacy because we can't offer programs if schools won't be in session. And so now we're getting that, those restrictions of allowing us to shift around what we know has been priority, but now it has allowed us to kind of, you know, now it's in a platform, now everybody can see it. Um, and so unfortunately it's a terrible way to finally get the resources and the know-how of how to do things, but at the same time, it's kind of given us a little bit of liberty in that context. It's a terrible context, I know, but. <laughs> uh, Liliana, and, um, I think I'd, I'd like to add too, it's something that I've reflected on, you know, recently is that the current situation has sort of leveled things for museums in, in some way or cultural organizations right now, because in, in many ways, we're all needing to start from scratch. Um, there's no new path. We're all charting it. So things are in some ways a little bit you know more equalized uh, not not definitely um at, at the very least when it comes to using uh, digital means to reach audiences and so it's been really neat to see how some of the smaller organizations are now front and center doing some of the same things uh, if not better than some of the bigger museums so there's it's been a unique sort of leveling of a moment where um you know, sort of reinventing or doing things from scratch again um, has um, uh, has in some ways allowed us not not to lean so much on institutional history or institutionalized practices and just really moving and reacting and responding to the moment. So I, I, I'd see that as an opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so one last question, um, unless anybody has anything to add to tackling about um, responding to kind of these museums who were putting on a pedestal for quote, doing good things, but are still having their own uh, internal issues. Um, our last question is, um, which Therese responded to very briefly, but I'd like to give the other panelists a chance to answer if they would like to. Um, what are your creative inspirations? Texts, peoples, movements, um, things that uh, inspire you and kind of keep you going? Uh, well, I'll go first, I guess, <laughs> since somebody else is. Um, I think my biggest inspiration, you guys just witnessed it, is uh, the work that I get to see be happening in the classroom. And that's just one example of some of the amazing work that Chicago, teacher, the Chicago teachers are doing. And again, I give them the curriculum, but allow them the freedom to implement it however they want. That's the collaborative component of the CLC. And so I love when I get emails um, and in invitations to come to the classroom and to see it and it's great it's beautiful it's a, it's such a I think such a really awesome way of seeing the impact and the importance of these programs um, and it has changed 
a lot of my views on museums um, because now at least I have a say in how these particular students that I'm working with are going to view the museum. Even if it means bringing the students and being, and the students critiquing the exhibits and saying, oh, you're missing here this, or you're missing here that, based on what they already learn um, in the classroom with the article. So it's also a really beautiful way of, you know, showing youth like, hey, you know, here's this interesting history, and then you go into a museum and they don't see it, and they ask, where is it? It's such a wonderful place for third graders, because I'm working with third graders to be in. Um, so for me, it's definitely that interaction, direct interaction with the students is to, um, I mean, similarly to Lillian, I think all the work that the amazing educators in the city are doing is great. Um, but I think for me more personally, what kind of influences a lot of my work and kind of keeps me going, um, honestly, is my uh, coming from this these institutions, as hard as they may be, uh, more accessible to them. Um, you know, it's something I want to share with them and be able to. Um, so I think that informs a lot of what um, I do, and it motivates me a lot. Um, so I think that was probably my biggest inspiration. I think it's kind of similar for me. It's seeing those moments when either a teacher or a student has so much. Um, pride in their face and you could see that emotion where they're they're feeling um just proud and having a positive sort of identity affirming experience um whether it was you know when that young student um a few decades ago uh, reacted to seeing the tortilla press on display to all the way all the way to this ex uh, other experience that liliana you shared uh when these students were bringing all of sort of past, present, and future together. And in my mind, that's the way I saw it, but also feeling like they, they are part um, of this uh, longer Chicago history. So those, those moments are the ones I live for. And usually, of course, it's when the students are sharing, you know, what they've learned, what they've created, and they're just really proud about sharing it with everyone else. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, that was a really wonderful um, cipher and I appreciate and, and honor all of you for uh, sharing all of your work and your experiences with us. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, I hope this was um, powerful and impactful and you, and you learned uh, a lot um, in joining us today. Um, quickly, I just wanted to share um, our upcoming programming. We've got one more, um, more kind of casual uh, get together for today. We have a happy hour and a poster session starting at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, it's our probably most informal uh, session, so grab your favorite beverage, uh, coffee, um, kombucha, wine, beer, cocktail, um, water, also uh, acceptable. Um, and join us. We've got a couple of presenters who are going to share uh, some posters they put together on some very uh, awesome topics. Um, and it's just going to be an opportunity for everyone to kind of chat. Um, we're we're going to be kind of bouncing around ideas about uh, what a radical future is for museums. What can we do as practitioners to really push forward uh, radical ideas and radical agendas um, to make our field better? And then um, so after that, we have two more ciphers for tomorrow, um, noon Eastern and 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, also should be really fantastic conversations, uh, really important conversations. Um, continuing our work, um, talking about, uh, speaking of adv advocacy in the field, um, how folks on the ground are really coming together to help each other. Uh, we have our museum workers speak folks talking about the recently launched um, Museum Workers a Mutual Aid Fund uh, that recently launched. Um, and then uh, diversity and exhibitions will be our closing session tomorrow afternoon. And so once again, um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you 
uh, everyone. Um, we do offer this programming for free for all of you. We try to be uh, as inclusive and transparent as possible uh, as an organization here at Museums and Race. Um, this year, the proceeds uh, for the donations, we are um, excited to be able to donate some of those proceeds to the Museum Workers Relief Fund. Um, that you can hear uh, more about tomorrow uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, and then some of the proceeds do uh, help us out in terms of putting together these programs. This is a volunteer organization. Uh, typically when we do uh, show up in person, um, the donations do cover the costs of our travel and housing to go to conferences. And so printing any of our materials, many of you have our museums and race buttons. Um, and all of our print materials uh, that we share in person. Um, so thank you. We appreciate every each and every one of you for joining. We appreciate each and every one of our presenters today and this entire week during our ciphers. I hope everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy. Um, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Um, thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time.